Like, I, I don't like going to concerts anymore. Yeah. Because fucking every venue around, especially around here, like, the fucking National has goddamn metal detectors. Like, what the fuck do you need those for? Like, we can carry in Virginia. Just let us fucking carry. Like, I'll show you my fucking permit if you want to. Like, it's not that difficult, but it you, that, um, you disarming me, not making me feel any fucking safer. Yeah, yeah, most of the problem is, like, the common ground that they find with all these denominators. Like, a lot of these people are kind of messed up on the head. Oh, yeah. Or on uh, psychotropic drugs. Or, right. Yeah. On and, or off the drugs. Or coming off of them. Yeah, <laughs> that's... A lot of them are also registered Democrats, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> right. Uh, and so you find also when Democrats, like same line, like they wanted to shut down all these uh, crazy houses, mental institutions, Silence, yeah. right? Where they used to just uh, put them away because yeah, people were park people. Were, they were a danger to themselves and others. And like this new form of like uh, liberal um, form of trying to help them was like, well, we'll help them in the community. Integrate them into society. Yeah. Right. It's like there are some people that cannot be rehabilitated. Well, this is kind of like the libertarian position on prison. If you're going to lock somebody in a prison, you better have a damn good reason. Well, and you should ask, are you ever going to let them out? Because you're making it an animal. Like, oh, yeah. you're isolating them from everything that makes them what is a human. <laughs> well, I guess what's like uh, at that point, they have no capacity for themselves to. Be civilized. They are behaving in a much manner like an animal. Exactly. Well, at least, that, yeah. Well, and that's and that's why that's why like I mean, at least for me, the like prisons should be reserved solely for like the worst of the worst, right? Like actual murderers, actual rapists, you know, real criminals. But with the war on drugs, they just lock people up for oh, you had 0.2 ounces of marijuana in your back pocket. Well, it's not even necessarily now just we're gonna, drugs. Like well, if yeah. you're caught carrying a firearm trying to protect yourself in the wrong, wrong imaginary lines yeah, exactly you're gone well, yeah and then and then they just throw you into criminals university and then you come out and you actually become a legitimate criminal because hey you just spent six years of your fucking life learning from literally the worst people that society has to offer about how to get rich quick when you get out right yeah it's the white collar crime that seems also like a strange reason to put somebody behind bars in a cage because it, they they aren't violent. You know, no. they're not. They haven't proven that they're going to actually hurt anybody. They've just stolen people's money. So, what's the best way to provide restitution? Have them make sit them pay it back. Pointlessly in yeah, a room. Like, yeah. yeah, It's just like ra- yeah, like like raid their bank accounts, freeze all their assets, re- like literally restorative justice. Right. In that, like, oh hey, you got robbed by this motherfucker that, with a Ponzi scheme. Here's your money back. How are you going to make the victim whole if you're in a cage? Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like when they seek restitution. Right. Uh, they have to wait until the guy's out of prison, I guess, right? Ten years yeah. later. So. If, if he ever gets out. You know? Right. Well, and that's the other thing, like, with death row. It's like, you know, the, the process is so, like, it's like either either expedite the process or get rid of it altogether. It's like you can't have this, like, middle ground where they can just sit for 20 years and appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal. And, you know, granted, there have been, you know, cases where innocent people have been put on death row. But it's like if you just draw that process out, like, that's almost worse than a punishment. Well, this is like Kamala Harris. She loves to keep people on death row, even though there's exonerating evidence. For, How many people was that now? Oh, I, she wanted cheap labor for the state. These, it's just them wanting to use the backs of the hard workers. It's like, oh, we can catch them young when they're in their prime and uh, use them to yeah. move forward on our... Which, uh, which, which, which amendment is that? Is it the 13th or the 14th? That, uh, that has the like oh it's unless uh, you're the 13th the, unless, yeah for a crime yeah. So yeah they they I mean that's that's how they got around it they're like oh we can't outwardly make these people slaves anymore we'll just kind of criminalize their skin color <laughs> right yeah or you know so, anybody, you're, 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 you've been convicted of the crime of existing while black like right anyone who's poor is drawn to these these sorts of uh, crimes that are more lucrative uh, because it's a black market you know right. they can make more money at this so they're they're uh, and you know, but even still, in some of those cases where there were truancy issues for some of these kids, and th- so she locked up their parents, you know, in a, a couple of nights in jail. Like, wow, that that's really gonna help the problem, you know? Yeah, that the clip where she was, you know, bragging about that letter with her friend that was, she was, you know, her kids were scared shitless or whatever. Like, oh, Camilla's gonna come lock you up if you don't go to school. It's like, I like the uh, throwback uh, with Harris and uh, what did she say? Like uh, fifteen. 1,500 people that she locked up? Yeah. Right? That sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. Little Tul- then, Tulsi pointed Tulsi, that yeah. out. Tulsi, yeah. And then saying like she's like, uh, was laughing about it, you know. Um, uh, she, she was asked on her, yeah, cannabis use. 
Like, oh, haha, I tried marijuana, but yeah, I'm going to put people on fucking... Oh, no, she's like, no, I, I fully intended to get high. That was the whole goal. And then at the same, you know, this is the hypocrites of, mm-hmm. hypocritical nature of politics is yep. do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Had a detective come when I was going to VCU. It was kind of like a, it was a political, it was a criminal justice class. So they brought in a detective to show the kinds of work that they do in case they want to go and get their criminal justice degree and be that kind of job. And so this woman comes in and she's talking about the types of people she locked away and the types of crimes that people are asking her for. And she said, yeah, she's put people away for um, uh, soliciting for soliciting prostitution, right? And uh, it's like, well, it's like, it's like, yeah, that's just like, is it a victimless crime? It's like, yeah, it's a victimless crime, but you know, we caught him. It was hilarious. It's like. Um, and I say, well, how do you feel about that? You know, uh, I guess the way, the way you're talking about it, the way you're kind of laughing about it, it's, it's a victimless crime, I'm sure. Like you said, it was married too, so it kind of ruined his family, and you're kind of uh, looking down upon this and kind of laughing off about it. And just ask her a question, how do you feel about that? And knowing that you just admit it's a victimless crime, and uh, she got very defensive, and uh, she started arguing hard back at me. And the manner in which she's carrying a gun too, so I'm sitting in the, in the middle row of the hall of the, the classroom down the aisle, and she stands up and she starts like walking towards me. Fast forward we, to mm-hmm. five minutes later, she's got a gun. Right. Yeah, like you're, you're, you're on the ground, you have a nine. Right Don't here. tase me, Take bro. It back. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she thinks I'm just a student. I, right, I, I did four years in the military as a cop, so like I, I know these intimidation tactics too. So it's like, like what are you like, doing? Don't here? fucking scare me. <laughs> Like, then, I, I've been through this class. Like, what are you doing? Like, I know what you're doing. I've done this. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, I'm the one who got kicked out of the classroom, though. Uh, but the teacher, of course. Yeah, but when I, when I came back to the teacher and told her, talked to her about it, uh, made her apologize, and told her, like, I'm the one who's paying for this class, right? You have someone who's kind of intimidatingly wise, you can say, marching towards a student with their hand kind of going out here. It's like you should be kicking that person out of the classroom. So you're you're right. I apologize. I'm sorry. You're saying that the college wasn't a safe space for you. Ah, right. (laughs) (laughs) That's very unfortunate to hear. It's it's bad that you had to pay so much to be threatened. Right. Maybe 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 you should go into the library where they had that cry closet. Oh yeah, yeah. That one university, the art installation where they had the cry closet for people who were too overwhelmed by finals. Mm. (laughs) Like, all right, sure. Yeah. The the reason that people enter those jobs or prostitution or, or what have you. Like, it's not like they grew up always thinking like, well, this is what I've always dreamed of doing. <laughs> I want to like, sell my body. They don't have money. a lot of other options. <laughs> so when you lock them up, you're just saying like, oh, well, now even that is taken away from you. You have no means to make any money. You're, you're going to have to settle for this terrible McDonald's flipping burgers or whatever. If you can even get if that you can get with that. your record. Yeah. Right, right, hmm. which has been taken away now. Exactly. I do like some of these uh, legislations that are uh, exonerating people now, expunging their records, because uh, I have a friend who like just ruined, wrecked them in trying to find better jobs on a marijuana charge, cannabis charge. Uh, and just found it difficult ever since. He's got to explain it. Um, and then just, uh, you know, in terms of trying to integrate yourself back into society, it makes it even difficult for something as silly as uh, cannabis. <clears throat> Um, I guess this goes back to, I guess there's the question of like, does poverty create crime or are some people more uh, prolective towards, uh, towards crime and then maybe it's the reverse because there's a lot of poor people like Appalachians and I don't know what their crime rates are and it doesn't seem like they're sky, rate, sky uh, rocketing to the rates of like Baltimore. Well, right I now. think it really comes down to the definition of crime because the state would say that all this drug dealing and stuff is crime. But it's, that's an opportunity for people in bad situations to have an income to try to separate themselves from that. So f- from a libertarian perspective, like the crime, it's from the competition of the black market. So these people, they sit, they're stepping on each other's territory. And so there's, you know, conflicts. And the state says that, oh, you're not allowed to resolve these conflicts because this is outside of the purview of what's okay, when in all actuality, it's voluntary trades between people. That's, I think, the crux of the problem. Yeah, that's certainly a part of it. It's, uh, it's difficult to find arbitration aside of it, especially when it's illegal. So you can't go like, to a cop and say, well, you know, he's just uh, jiffed me off you know, a dime bag or something. And it's like, uh, who? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we'll step right in. Um, at the same time, you also mentioned it's something that a lot of people, uh, in the beginning, I used to look at the victimless crimes, like you look at the federal reports and stuff like that. Yeah, 76% of it could say are victimless crimes. Uh, but I guess when you look at it 
more thoroughly that a lot of these crimes overlap with other crimes. So it's not just he just got caught with like uh, cocaine. A lot of it's like he also, yeah, got caught. He had cocaine and he shot somebody, and he broke into somebody's home, and there was assault. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people just look at it as just uh, a there's a simple one part of the crime and think all of his victims when there's invariably, especially since it's tort warfare, like you're mentioning, does involve a lot of other kinds of crimes. So when you are in sort of that sort of lifestyle um, and you do crimes, you become a magnet for like the spotlight of the police. But on a day to day basis, you might be a normal person that's driving, possessing something and get caught up in sort of a traffic violation. And then, you know, you end up in the dragnet. And that's, I think, the problem is there is this huge dragnet. So then if they make it a black market, it ups the risk level. So then only the most ruthless people. So then the people that are like at the bottom, they're like, oh, well, that guy's making money selling crack. I'm going to go kick his door in, stick a gun in his face, take his. And then, yeah, that person eventually for the path that they're taking, they do get hemmed up because they've brought it upon themselves. If that if that yeah. fake makes sense, yeah. What is how does the um, when when the mob would run like a certain neighborhood or something in New York, you know, you would see, all right, we run this this uh, street corner or something, and we're going to provide protection to all these people. And so they're not nece- basically what they're doing is uh, what government does in a way is they're providing defense, which is not real defense, and then they're saying um, we're going to you know, now you have to pay us money. And uh, it's not voluntary. You have to do it. But I think it, even if it, there were no drugs, this type of thing, those types of bad actors, like you're saying, would, would still exist. And they would still be willing to use violence on random people. Right. Uh, I think that's an interesting point because sometimes people think, well, if you legalize it and all the crime will go away. It's like, you know, there's some people who are already in that mentality of trying to find another way to hurt people. It's uh, kind of like... That uh, scene from um, The Walking Dead is like, look, you guys are, I'm going to come here, take half of what you've got, right? I'm not a farmer. <laughs> I'm not going to attend to some fields. <laughs> so some people are kind of like, they're like, I'm not a nine to five guy. I'm not going to sit in some office job. You go ahead and do it. I'm going to find a way to take some of that from you. Well, and the real problem, like, like you were saying with like, ar- you know, not having a, a way to arbitrate, you know, disputes and stuff like that. You know, you have to be able to defend what's yours at that point, like even even in a black market. And, you know, that's why there's so many guns and that's why there's so much, you know, because you look at the statistics and if you remove the if you remove the the suicides and like accidental like deaths from like firearms, you know, 90 percent of it is gang related or like like violent crime because of like drugs and turf wars and stuff like that. So it's yeah, it's, it's basically people who are like, all right, well, the state wants us locked in a cage and we have no other way to settle our disputes, then, all right, me and my boys are going to roll up on that side of the block where, you know, the the people we're beefing with, you know, where they live and we're just going to shoot up their fucking house, you know, roll through with an, with an, with a full auto that we got and, you know, and a minivan. But like you said that, like, um, places that have like strong gun laws, mm-hmm. right? It means for everyone else. But don't you think if like they say that uh, having a, uh, Guns make nice neighbors, right? As the saying goes, something like that. An armed society is a polite society. Right. Don't, of course, you would think that these uh, armed gangsters know that the other gangsters are going to be armed too. You know, there's nothing politeness of uh, interactions going on still between them. And uh, I guess speaking of gun laws and stuff like that, one of the <laughs> worst, uh, of strictest uh, gun laws uh, in the country you'll find is in Maryland. Well, they need to up the gun. They need more guns so they can get rid of some of the rats. So right. Start yeah. <laughs> shooting the rats. I was like, there you go. That That's that's how Cummings can get, you know, instant jobs into a city is just make everyone, a, deputize everybody as a pest controller. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then just give, just give them a shit ton of 22s and just go out and exactly. get rid of it. We can, we can have... Uh, gun safety classes and we can like teach everybody and then we can unleash them and these rats they'll they'll move out because you know when you make it hard for them to live they'll leave well yeah and i I think that's also part of the problem like nowadays is like with the proliferation of like just absolute dog shit information about firearms from hollywood 
is like kids in these neighborhoods are growing they up and they're that. yeah yeah they're yeah they're seeing the you know the sideways gangster shooting you know one handing it or like they're you know they're watching shit like Rambo where like they think it's realistic to one hand an M60 it's like that thing's almost 20 fucking pounds unloaded like you're not you're not Rambo you're not holding that thing up by yourself <laughs> and but it like it causes a lot of these kids to get that sort of mentality so like you know when you, when they you know see a gun they're like oh I can just pick this up and nothing's gonna happen because Hollywood never shows the consequences of those actions and that's how you end up with you know eight year olds shooting their six year old sister in the face because they don't know what they're doing because their parents never wanted to teach them yeah and their parents got you know spooked or whatever and had you know like a three fifty seven laying in the the drawer un like loaded and with you know with quick access. So yeah, the, like there's definitely an element that like firearms training and like safety needs kids to be. used to be able to take their guns to school. There used to oh, be yeah. like gun clubs like all over the country, mm-hmm. like um, all over the state of New York. There's like all these photos of like just kids just taking their guns in their truck and just going to their high school. Yeah, high schools used to have rifle teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and now it's uh, like unheard of. It's a weird thing uh, to see. Um, well, even, like the the local cops, like they would they would literally show up at like the middle schools and the high schools, and they would teach like firearms handling classes. When I, my dad taught hunter safety and he taught it in the school of my hometown. So all my friends, we came there and we had guns in the school. It was a weird feeling, but that's how we learned how to handle firearms safely. Right. I think a big problem is uh, people deferring responsibility, not thinking that they are the ones that have to first try to solve the problems, but they first try to look to others to solve their problems. Right, it's kind of there's this weird thing like uh, the Kenny Kitty Janess sort of thing that happened where she was a uh, this happened in New York. Everyone's looking outside of their uh, apartment windows because they hear some screams happening, and then so they see uh, this woman being assaulted constant, mm-hmm. and everyone's like yelling at the at the attacker, and the guy leaves, and then uh, everyone goes back in. And she's like trying to go back to the apartment, so she gets attacked twice. I think it happened three times total. The third time she actually died. But each subsequent time, the second time, people are outside of the apartment window yelling, and they all think that somebody, one of them, is calling the cops. One of them is calling for help. Nobody did, right? They, they, it was kind of, kind of like this thing where they say that the worst thing you ever want if you're in like a situation, in an accident in public, is uh, to be surrounded by people because none, none of sometimes won't take the initiative yep. to do something. They'll just kind of stand there and just kind of watch you, you know, bleed out. That was like a story that we were talking about before the show. It was the pizzeria where the guy. Tell the lady, um, I'm sorry, but you're butting in front of everybody. And she's like, what? You can't say that to me. And she walks out and gets her boyfriend, who's like six foot four and 300 pounds. And the guy, he comes in and then beats the hell out of the, the guy who told her to, you know, get out of line. Yeah. And, um, and all the people in the pizzeria are just standing in there and pretending like it's not happening. And so was the guy right. before, too. He was just on his phone pretending like this wasn't happening to him. So it helps to be, like, recognized well, yeah, yeah like this the, is happening. The, right. Like what you were just talking about, the Kitty Genovese case, like that was probably one of the first like instances where like psychologists could like look and observe the bystander effect because that's what they called it is it's yeah. Like the more people you have around in a serious situation, like the less likely you're going to get help because everyone already defers responsibility and they're like, oh, they got it. They got it. They'll do it. Right. And that's like, that's one of the first things I learned. Uh, I had to take a CPR class for a job I had. And one of the first things they told, they told us like going through the steps was you have to, you literally have to physically like point and like get some, like a single person's attention and be like, you have the responsibility of calling 911. Like get on your phone right now, dial 911, get them on the horn. Because if you just say, Hey, please, somebody call 911, no one will do it. All right. And then you'll sit there, you know, giving CPR for this person, then they'll probably die before the, before any help ever arrives. So you have to designate responsibility to somebody. And that's like one of the first things they tell you before you even start the actual, like, you know, procedure of CPR, like get help because everyone will just stand around and be like, oh my gosh, who's going to help? It seems like they've been kind of used to be uh, being bossed around and ordered around. Schooled. They've been schooled their whole lives. You know. Right. 15,000 hours mm-hmm. you don't know what to do until somebody tells you what to do All right. well and that's and that's that's the greatest tragedy of public schooling is like you know you like especially when you graduate when you're 18 it's like now all of a sudden you're old enough to make all these adult responsibilities but two months ago you still had to ask permission to use the bathroom speaking right. of public schooling so let's talk about Baltimore city of rats <laughs> uh, so you have 13 Baltimore City's high schools zero students proficient in math 
So, and, and analyzed from Project Baltimore, 2017, they uh, tested data and found one third of high school schools in Baltimore last year had zero students proficient in math. Uh, there's this guy who created his own school, uh, Baltimore College, a school for boys. Good, right? Uh, and they have a motto in the gym. It's called, there's an urgency about the work we're doing. And so the urgency was born out of need because nine out of 10 black boys in Baltimore City are not reading at grade level. And so it kind of continues. So he talks about uh, North Baltimore uh, School, kind of where he is. Uh, there are no girls, This is great. He says that uh, it helps them stay very focused on their studies. I think that's a uh, kind of woke position because uh, boys and girls learn differently, right? It's a different environment for the girls than it is for boys at public schools when teachers are about women make up like 76, 77%, right? So they're gonna be more catered towards raising boys, teaching them as they would girls, right? Girls wanna read more of the romantic stuff, boys wanna read more of the adventures, pirating books, washing sort of stuff. And so he, he, he actually says that uh, the teachers, the teaching staff is 60% male. So the complete opposite, mm -hmm. I think that's great. And so, like, so people are like, well, what, what's the effect of that, All right? Has, uh, has that improved? Uh, he says, yeah, uh, the score proficiently in math tests by 60%. Wow. Right? They're, they're going up in, uh, all across the board. Uh, and that's Baltimore. So 13 out of their high schools, they can't do math. It reminds me of, like, uh, there's, like, some high schools in New York where uh, they can't even write English. Mm. Uh, they have to be retaught English again when they try to go to college and just kind of redo the whole thing all together. So some college is accepting them? When they... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess there's some community colleges, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, or, uh, and or they got in on some affirmative action, right. sort of Title IX right. nonsense. Like, hey, we have a quarter to fill. You have the right skin color. That's not racist at all. No, not at all. <laughs> Wait, we accept people on merit? Shh. Right. That's racist, obviously. Right, and, and this whole thing is, is, has been coming down because of uh, Trump's quip with uh, Cummings, Congressman Cummings. Elijah Cummings, yes. Elijah Cummings. Uh, so Trump was tweeting um, that his city is Baltimore. Uh, he's done a very poor job in his district in the city of Baltimore. He's failed badly. And of course, Cummings, who's black, you know, nobody likes uh, that kind of criticism, you know, just says that you're racist, right? So it's kind of like uh, the go-to phrase when you don't know how to argue back and uh, the facts are stacked against you is to just <laughs> call in the R word. <clears throat> I don't think that word has much meaning anymore. It, yeah. it really can't, no. I don't think. Yeah. And that's what's so funny about so many people on the right or libertarians trying to say, I'm, no, I'm not a racist like Trump. You know, or I'm not. So to please don't call me that because I think he's racist too. And then invariably, there's some other issue where that person will be called a racist. And it's because they support, uh, they oppose minimum wage or something. And then we'll right. be like, yeah. well, now that, that makes that, you racist. That makes uh, <laughs> punk rock libertarians racist because I'm pretty sure that they oppose also minimum wage. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> How dare they? Right. <laughs> and um, of course, uh, Cummings' Baltimore home was burglarized two days ago. So right. <laughs> it, 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 this happens, and then Trump responds immediately, and, and you're just like, wow, how painful must that have been when Cummings got that call? He's like, no, Baltimore is perfectly safe. What are you talking about? There's right. no rats here at all. I think it was Missouri the very next day or the same day when he made that comment uh, that his house got burglarized, right? Um, oh. Cummings who talks about, like, there's people who are in dire need across the border trying to get here, these refugees. Uh, how do you know the person, as uh, they're saying now, who was trying to get into your house wasn't a refugee, wasn't trying to get in here, trying to find asylum, because they're finding that the state of Baltimore is so bad that it qualifies for people to uh, seek asylum if they weren't uh, Americans. <gasps> wow. Yeah, so the How long has he represented uh, Maryland? That's a good 20 question. years? I think over 20 years? Yeah, Some time. Yeah, yeah sounds about right. So the homicide rates, uh, yeah, incredibly high. Uh, so for example, let's look at the homicide rates. Baltimore has a homicide rate of 55.8 per 100,000, compared to El Salvador, 60 per 100,000, Venezuela, 56 per 100,000. Wow. Yeah, so they have more homicides than Honduras, <laughs> the country of Guatemala, Brazil, and South Africa. Which are all, well, with the exception of South Africa, all victims of US foreign policy. So apparently we can't even escape it here. 
right. domestically. I, I guess South Africa is probably a victim of British and Dutch yeah, foreign policy. It, it, yeah, imperialism <laughs> and you know all that fun stuff. Sure. Yeah, that is fascinating. Because, uh, yeah, you could justify that people from Baltimore could make the case, no, we should be able to get asylum somewhere else in the United States because our, our homeland, our hometown is so bad. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not squatters. They're refugees uh, seeking escape in your home when you leave, <laughs> uh, your, uh, leave it absent. This happened to a friend of ours. I won't say his name, but uh, doing contract work to kind of help fix, fix his house. And uh, like two days where the contractor wasn't there, somebody came in, changed the lock, created a fake uh, lease. And uh, the cops were like, yeah, it's, it's a fake lease, but he's got squatters rights now. And we can't kick him out because he's stating that he's been there for a month. <clears throat> Wow. So it's taken over his property, right? Uh, um, his resources. Yeah, that's when you just show up with, an, with like five other dudes that are heavily armed. And you're like, you don't have squatters, right? <laughs> Get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, your, your shit's been revoked. Well, Bye. like when you look at reality, what's the real minimum wage? Zero. If you don't have a job, what's like, who actually has to defend yourself? Well, you have to defend yourself. So who actually has to defend your property? Well, you kind of have to kind of do it yourself. It's kind of hard to do wow, it. Wow, what a racist position. <laughs> You're right, right? right? I'm like a self-supremacist. I'm yes. just going to have to do it myself. Sorry. Right. How, how dare you? <laughs> and you look at the previous mayors. There you have uh, Sheila Dixon. She was convicted for, I guess, stealing gift cards from the poor. <laughs> of all the things. Of all the things. Yeah. <laughs> You have Stephanie Rawlings Blake. She stepped down after promoting the Baltimore riots. You have uh, she, yeah, she was the one who was like, "There will be people who will protest, and there will be people who will destroy." And it was just like, "Those people are bad, right?" Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Are we gonna jail those people or what? That, that sounds like that sounds like a freaking what's his face, Ted Wheeler from uh, is either Portland or Seattle, where he's basically just like giving Antifa carte blanche to like do whatever they want. Like they like they're literally like right, impeding, they're like right. they were like impeding traffic and like right. holding people up and like trying to like bust up people's cars and stuff. And the mayor's just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not going to send the police in, whatever. Right. You got Catherine Poe. Uh, she was raided by the FBI for taking bribes. She wrote a children's book, right? So I'm like investigating what exactly was going on here. And she forced health insurers to buy them uh, in masses to do business in the city. Uh, and this was this was a lot of money. This like hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's just kind of putting this through. Uh, and so even her, Mayor uh, Catherine Poe, so people are saying, like, well, it's person in the city of rats. What are you guys talking about, rats? Even she stated, like, a year or two before, <laughs> whoa, like, this is on video feed. You can smell the rats. <laughs> <laughs> smell a rat. <laughs> and I've been to Baltimore, and it's a very shady town. Uh, there's some interesting nightclubs, but everything is centered around like the hub of the Inner Harbor. Anywhere outside of that, uh, it's like danger zone. You don't go there. It's like complete ghettoized, like circle ring of poverty and despair all around that. Uh, it's so bad that they even have, you heard of red light districts, right? Yep. There's blue light districts where you don't go in there. Mm -hmm. So much crime happens in there. It's like, that is a no-go zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you stay away from blue light districts. Uh, but that's not to say that just because your neighborhood is not uh, prescribed as a blue light district, that crime doesn't happen there too. And like even during daylight, even uh, what's his name, Baltimore's new deputy police commissioner, he got mugged a gun. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, he's a pencil pusher, but that was just the, like, the picture like, of him like, was hilarious. Well, like yeah. look at yeah, look, looking at his picture, you're like, all right, first of all, that kid definitely had some connections to get that job in the first place, and. You look like the he looks like the kind of person that you could have pushed over for his lunch money. It looks school. like a yeah. third-rate Harry Potter character. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was he uh, yeah, doing out money, at night? Kid, right. He was there with his wife, I guess. Yeah, he was there with his wife. So he could have been carrying, but he probably wasn't. Should have been, right? Yeah. He he, was, he's a he's a pencil <clears throat> pusher. He's probably he's probably not going to. It was uh, 9 p.m. Uh, he was approached by uh, four men in a white SUV near Paniston Park. He was there with his wife. Yeah. Uh, and he just got the job in April. And so right away, got robbed at gunpoint, his cell phone taken away from him, his wallet, her purse, um, yeah. and just... We still left in the car. Right. I mean, at least they got their lives, right? Yeah. But yeah. some people don't. Oh, yeah. I uh, would, if, if you tasked me to do what those people do, which is go out in Baltimore in different parts of that, even, you know, sketchy parts of Richmond even, I would say, okay, I will go. I need, like, an M16. I need, like, a couple... Um, 
a couple extra clips. Level four plates. Magazines, I mean. Yeah. And I, rifle, yeah, thank you. rifle plates. Right. Thank you. I need some body armor. I yeah. need like a, one of those tactical helmets. Like I need all that stuff. And then yes, I will go out like, but that's the thing is the average person feels so safe. You know, oh yeah, we're just going to go out at night on the town and it's not going to be that dangerous. And this would, is a disconnect I think a lot of modern day people have because I mean, just look at normal situations people go to. People think you go to the grocery store to get food when in actuality that's not where food comes from like it takes a lot of work to make food it takes a lot of work oh uh, where's telling uh, me the cow doesn't just come prepackaged like that right cut up like what that for fuck? you to just throw on the grill no it's not quite like that so we are disconnected from a lot of things in a lot of ways and people are so deluded they th- you know entitlement mentality because things have been just offered up to them it's when reality hits them in the face like a person who thinks they're in a position of authority and he gets robbed in real life this is like a a, like a smackdown for this dude it's like these people can't protect you either you have to you know take ownership of it it's like a gotham batman wouldn't try to save yeah yeah um, not, yeah. Not, not, there's knockout gangs. Just I think it's the scariest part of this. Right. Like they even attack during the day. Yeah. Uh, we got we got a friend uh, Rachel who goes up there, and I, Warner's like, yeah, stick around the Inner Harbor and don't go off exploring much of the uh, other areas. Yeah, and I mean it, it's bad enough up there that like what a few years ago they had that like massive shootout with that dude who like hijacked a bus. And like there was like like half the Baltimore County PD had to show up, and they, they got into this massive shootout with this dude on this like like public tra- like the city transit bus and everything like that. And like there were there were like four different I saw like four different body cam footage angles from it and everything like that. And the cops are like woefully untrained. Like it's like none of them were taking cover properly. Like one guy was basically just standing out in the open trying to like you know fire as many shotgun rounds as he could pop, like into the bus with her like there are people like other than the suspect in there and this dude just fucking blind firing a shotgun i'm like oh boy. Have, so uh, an accountability <laughs> problem too right like yeah. at the same time that people won't hold them like won't take responsibility uh there's massive like the system that we have those people we can't hold them accountable in any way because it's no, a faceless all. it's a yeah. faceless like organization I think they had curfew. Hasn't Baltimore have curfew before? Right? I, I, think I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I, would. I think they instituted it during the riots at one yeah, point. Yeah, I think because uh, I had a teacher, criminal justice teacher, and she was telling me that, like, one way, like, she came from Baltimore. One way to kind of lower the crime rate, she says, like, you just uh, put them a night in jail. And, you know, so it's rather they be in jail off the streets and they won't get killed, do anything criminal. Uh, and so, and I was like, for what? For being out, like, at night? And it's like, yeah, you know, it's better putting them somewhere else than having them out on the streets. Uh, and you can't until proven innocent. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so you can't say, though, a lot of this stuff, because this is where, uh, what's the name of the guy? Freddie Gray, uh, who got killed, right? Yeah, by the police when they lapped him up in the paddy wagon and took yep. him for a ride. Which, right. was, which was standard <laughs> procedure, by the way. Yeah. Um, you can't say, because here's the thing that... Um, I always kind of bring up and a lot of people think like, again, white people are like, they have this imagination, like all cops are white people. When you look at Baltimore, that's really not the case. The majority of the cops there are minorities. Most of the higher ranking positions of officers and stuff like that are minorities. Black chief of police and black mayor, uh, most of the city council members are black. Uh, you can't blame this on like, sometimes they want to say this is white supremacy or institutionalized racism. That's some uh, weird looking white supremacy. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that don't look right. It's Clayton Bigsby. <laughs> Y'all want to see my face? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's not what I picture exactly white supremacy to be when a majority of people, it's all the official important posts are minority people, right? Um, it's, uh, yeah, my, minorities do that to each other. All right, black people do it to black people. Uh, white people. Is, is it like is this the way it is? So it's Frederick Bastiat said it's the fiction of you know everybody trying to live at the expense of everybody else. Yep. And I think the only good thing of Baltimore I've ever come out of was uh I mean you have you have Pose Poseberry there, uh, they kept him because that's where he died. 
Uh, but there's this cool thing. You guys ever seen Gang of New York? Of yeah. Course, right? Love that movie. All right. So remember the scene where they kind of have to uh, dress in different clothing and to go back into the voting booth? Um, there's a word for that. I forgot what it's called. But yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Were, like they, yeah, they kept like shaving them and everything. Right, right. It's like a different voter coming in. Uh, so there's two things that were happening during that time that people would get kidnapped for. Uh, you'd be Shanghai, you wake up on a ship, you know, after drinking, you fall through a trap door, and then you're like on your way to China somewhere. And now you're in the Royal Navy. <laughs> <laughs> the other is uh, you wake up uh, in an alley the next day because apparently someone was pining with drinks and got you so drunk that it was election night, and they kind of get you in there to vote again, get you drunk, change your clothes, go back again and vote. Called right? cooping. Cooping, right. Um, so there's so mystery about Edgar Allan Poe and how he died. And there's some interesting facts that kind of led to how he could have died. The same night that he disappeared, nobody knows what happened. There was a warning in the Baltimore newspapers. Do not go out at night. There are cooping gangs that will be roaming about as there is this election night. Mm. Um, and so Edgar Allan Poe was found with clothes that did not belong to him, they say. Sizes, I think, too small for him, right? And he uh, pissed drunk. Uh, and he's not a guy who usually gets drunk. I think he had problems actually with drinking a lot himself. So uh, falls exactly into the uh, parameters of a cooping uh, cause of his death. So you could say politics killed Virginia's favorite son because there is a phrase because Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Richmond all kind of fight for Poe. And, right. But there is one passage that Poe once wrote. This is, above all, I'm always a Virginian first. And that's what the <laughs> Richmond Poe Museum always says to, to beat all their arguments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that Poe belongs to us, to Richmond. <laughs> well, politics also killed one of Virginia's other favorite sons. You know, R.I.P. to John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> a real one. <laughs> real Six American separate Tyrannus. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's, that's Baltimore. Uh, that's a lot of stuff that I guess uh, punk rock that returns have to kind of own up for. That's their city. <laughs> Take responsibility. Take responsibility. <laughs> that's the right? first step to recovery. Yeah. I, I think so too. Have I've been preaching, balls? you know, taking responsibility this whole podcast. So yeah, take responsibility. Right. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> the, this comment <laughs> wasn't towards comings. There was also to, uh, to them as well. You know, I understand the fashion of those punk rock libertarian podcast people with the ripped clothes and shredded clothing and all that <laughs> stuff and looking like you're garbage, you know, it kind of, it's fashionable, but it's you, camouflage. You don't have to kind of reflect that in your own city too. And yep. do like life imitates art sort of thing. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know how on a serious note, I don't know how libertarians in New York and these liberal States, I don't know how they live because like at the very least we can own some guns around here, you know, and we, we can have some freedoms. So, it's, it seems like a, they're, they're going against the grain. <laughs> right. Um, but what you find in Baltimore, it's a pattern, though, that you see when it's democratically run, right? Uh, Baltimore's been under Democratic Party control for like uh, 50 years or so. And, and every single time, like, they've been given packages, like, in the billions of dollars. Uh, and they've done, like, really nothing to improve it. And every time, like, they pass, like, these, I don't know, packages, like, that's going to improve the city, it comes with, like, more new taxes, more new regulations. You push everybody out, and then all you have left are uh, refugee status people that could seek asylum in your own city, kind of like in Detroit right now. Um, and I drove through Detroit in like downtown area, really nice. Outside of that, yeah, I know. Well, but with Detroit, they have you know the threat management group and the successful you know case for like a privatized sort of police force. Right, mm -hmm. right. So because that, he went in there and actually like got it done he stopped all the hijacking of trucks that went in there and with that extra money he was able to offer free services, free to, services the community. to the yep. community for right. security yeah because uh, he, he already had a client base of like business owners who were actually paying for his services and to protect their businesses and so yeah he like built up enough extra kind of like capital to right you know protect like normal people who couldn't obviously pay for the right the services but like he, he holds his people to like an even higher standard than like i think you know, even like the most like elite like cops right. would. I don't think he actively goes after any sort of military nope. or police. He tries to get people that he trains from the ground up. He actually he actually apparently recruits a lot from like social workers and, and people who are, who have been in that sort of like field because he uh, I, I watched an interview with him a, a while ago and he went through like his whole kind of like history and he was talking about how like the first thing he looks for is like you have to be a people person. 
He's like, if you don't love people and like I see any sort of like misanthropic tendencies in you, he, like he won't even get you a second interview. The police are trained to protect themselves first. Right. Right. So when they go into the situation, it's like, it's about me. Fuck your dog. You know, fuck whatever's uh, going on. <laughs> There's here. been a lot of stories about that. Yeah. yeah All right. Lately. I mean, that's how Waco popped off. <laughs> Literally. That's because the, dogs the, yeah, the ATF showed up, yeah. killed the dogs that were in a pen. Nothing was like, they weren't being aggressive or anything. They popped them and then they're like, what are you doing? And then firefight. So, yeah. Whereas, uh, these kind of security, it's kind of like a uh, fireman, right? They're, they're out there to protect you, your house, whatever they can find when they approach the situation, uh, and protect that. Rescue and they only show up when that. needed. Right. Uh, whereas the private security is like, well, we gotta, we have you, the customer, the client, you can say is on the line, right? Without you, there's no pay and then there's no job. Right. I right. <laughs> think about a way to escalate any situation is to just murder some some person's dog who people love you know their dogs like we i have a dog you have a dog it's like you imagine somebody just walks into your house and murders your dog and that's called that's, 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 stay called, calm. that's called john wick yeah <laughs> that's literally that's literally the first <laughs> john wick movie yeah. <laughs> and then we all know what happens to the people who fucked with him right so right. <laughs> like, still need to see john wick who three. wouldn't go to those lanes it's fantastic um there was some you know there's a situation, I think it was a mayor of some town in Maryland, where he received a package. Like sometimes some people would uh, send drugs to somebody's house, and then they'll come up the, the same day and take him from them. It's like, oh, yeah, it's not for you. It's for me. He's dead like, drop. Right, dead drop. Uh, so the cops were like seeing a package going to this guy's house, and they didn't know it belonged to a mayor. And so, of course, like the wife, like, hey, it's a package. She brings it in, and all of a sudden, you see like uh, the grandma or whatever's there. They see all the cops coming over the backyard, jumping over fences, coming in there. Guns drawn, everyone freaking out. They got the, the whole family on the floor, hogtied. I think they killed their dog. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Right. I remember this story. It was in like, um, I want to say Montgomery County. Yeah, yeah. Not surprising. Right. So Montgomery I, and PG are just I don't as know. bad as Baltimore. Yeah. I don't know. I think uh, the number of dogs that the Viper Threat Management System is the name of the security group in Detroit has killed is uh, zero. zero. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I, yeah, I would venture a guess it's probably zero. Right. Uh, I would imagine like they would have high insurance enough to pay out and they, you know, I can't really imagine seeing even dogs really attacking people, even coming to approach them. Like the mailman doesn't really particularly have that problem. I don't or, really, Yeah, or like a, like a UPS driver. UPS worker, or right? Amazon. What yeah. are the rates of them getting bit all so the time? So the problem is these cops aren't hired on their intellect, right? It's, it's a common known <laughs> thing that the humans are smarter than dogs. It's not that hard to go to the grocery store and buy a pack of hot dogs and then like chuck a hot dog and be like, oh, then, the hey, dog well, is distracted. Yeah, now, now, now the guard dog goes away. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> there's a Supreme Court ruling up in the New England states that said that there was a guy who tried to apply to be a cop, but uh, they said, yeah, your key's too high. And it's a food for suit for discrimination. Uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, said, yeah, sorry, cops are right. Uh, they can have their uh, uh, quotas and how they're going to uh, their select their, their, the people, their yeah. criteria, and you're just too smart to be a cop. Yeah, they, most... Most of the psychological evals that I've heard about from like the major like police departments across the country, they actively look for people who were ex-military and especially like ex-combat arms and ones that have significantly lower IQs because they're easier to, you know, get them to follow orders. Right. Don't question what you're doing. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. then that's how the whole thin blue line mentality comes into play where it's, you know, oh, we got to protect our own. and you Punisher. Know, yeah. Right. Us versus them. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is, that is the epitome of dork fascism. Like, literally, I guarantee you none of those people actually read the comic because the Punisher kills cops. He literally <laughs> <right>. murders <laughs> cops in cold blood. Just no remorse. But yet these retards are out here fucking putting his, putting his logo all over their gear Punisher, and thinking right? they're yeah. badass. It's like, no, you just look like a dipshit. Like, you just made yourself a target for the Punisher. Exactly. Well, yeah. The, <laughs> the, the guy who created the Punisher or does the comics, I believe he came out with a new one that says it's got the Punisher and he's talking to some cops and he's like I don't want to see you guys using my decal in your car anymore <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. I, 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 yeah I saw the panels from that it's fucking hysterical well it was a long time ago where it was uh, wrong for comic books comic book code of authority where uh, I think it was some kind of legislation in which the comics could not depict like they wanted to pass this off for kids sure but you can't depict cops or the government in a negative or a bad fashion and that persisted for like a couple of decades until comic books. Well, I mean, the, the, you look at the you look back at the golden era of like like DC and Marvel. It's all it's it's literally just World War II mouthpiece propaganda. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. like like yeah. literally every every other cover is like you know <laughs> Captain Captain America sucker punching Hideki Tojo with the most racist fucking caricature possible, or you know sucker punching Hitler, and then Superman's you know or if you bought DC, you know you flip thir- you know three pages in and Superman's telling you to you know recycle tin because they need it for the war effort. You know, be a real superhero. It's like it's all just fucking propaganda. So almost all of like mainstream media has been co opted into you know the status propaganda. Oh, of course it has. Yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, punk rock libertarian podcast guys, clean up your city. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. Hoorah! Send bachelors and come heavily armed. <laughs> <laughs>